Whoops, sorry. Liz, should I go ahead? I can't see. Um... Yeah, I think you could start. I see it looks like this slow down of people coming in the room, but people can still come in, obviously. Right. So. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, we are, uh, thank you for coming to Bridging the Stormwater Funding Gap. Um, let's see, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, we have our gold and silver and bronze level sponsors. I'd like to thank them for enabling Environmental Congress to be possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank you to our nonprofit co-sponsors. Um, there are colleagues and allies who we collaborate with to protect and preserve the environment. And it takes a team to get the ball down the field and we are very grateful to have them on our team. And we also would like to thank our business co-sponsors. Um, many thanks to them um, for supporting our work and for the work that they themselves do. And thank you also to you, to all of our environmental commissioners and everyone who's come to this session um, for taking the time out of your day and actually out of your week since we're going all week this week um, to learn and to be inspired. And thank you also for your kind donations. So here's a reminder um, that election day is Tuesday, November 8th. There's all the information about the various deadlines and the link where you can go to register. Um, ANJEC is a 501c3 organization. We are apolitical and endorse no candidates. We do strongly encourage you to exercise your voice and to vote this November. So if you are not registered to vote, or if you're not sure, you can go to that link at the bottom and you can check to see your status or you can register to vote. So before we begin, we have some housekeeping. Um, please type your questions into the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we will be monitoring the questions and answer them in type when needed or ask the speaker to address the question. If you have technical difficulty, um, our fearless leader, Liz Ritter, has shared her phone number. You can reach her and she will help you um, with any kind of difficulties you're running into. Um, all sessions are being recorded and will be posted at a later date on ANJEC's YouTube channel, which is called ANJEC Views, and a link will be sent to attendees. And also, um, all slide decks will be available on our website probably next week, but you will have access to these slides after um, tonight's session. So tonight's session, this is the agenda. Um, we're looking at stormwater utility. Uh, so um, we have three expert speakers and these are the topics that they are gonna be addressing. What, um, what it is, Stormwater Utility 101 will be Brie Callahan. How it works, it's Stormwater Utility on the Ground, Facts from the Field will be Elizabeth Treadway and how it's going. Pursuing Stormwater Utility in New Jersey will be addressed by Patricia Lindsay Harvey. And so I would like to introduce you to all three of our expert speakers and then um, we will get into the presentations. So um, Brie Callahan is, is a stormwater manager for New Jersey Future. She works to help local governments and utilities create stormwater utilities more affordably and effectively to reduce flooding and improve water quality. She's responsible for creating a web-based resource center, which is terrific, you're gonna learn all about it, um, organizing training sessions and facilitating a peer-to-peer -peer network of local officials. Uh, prior to joining New Jersey Future, Bree served as executive director and baykeeper for Massachusetts Baykeeper and worked as a legal and environmental consultant in both Philadelphia and Boston. Bree earned her JD from the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law and holds a BA in architecture and environmental studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, next up, we will have Elizabeth Treadway. She's a program manager at WSP. She has over 38 years of experience, including the management of local government services in stormwater management and financing, transportation planning, public transport operate, excuse me, public transit operations, solid waste management, fleet operations, and other public works programs. Her technical expertise includes service evaluation, planning, public policy, permit development and negotiation, cost and benefit analysis, management, scheduling, and implementation of a wide variety of public works initiatives. As department director, she was responsible for the planning, development, financing, and implementation of public works services for the city of Greensboro, North Carolina. And then uh, we also have Patricia Lindsay Harvey. She's the chair of the Willingboro Environmental Commission Green Team and a commissioner of the Willingboro Municipal Utility Authority. So she has a unique point of view about how to move your municipality or your utility authority towards investigating stormwater utility as a financing option. She's also the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization, Edu Sports Academy, which has a sports education program, Swing to T Golf, which has been voted best in Burlington County. So thank you to all of you. Um, we really appreciate your coming here and sharing your knowledge with our commissioners. 
So now I'm going to, I'm not sure how to switch sharing. So I'm going to stop share and then reshare um, with uh, Bree's presentation. So just be patient. I'll be back in just a second here. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna, let's see, can I meet myself? I can meet myself. I'll meet myself, but um, Bree, you can take it away. All right, great. Thanks so much, Sheila. Um, as Sheila mentioned, my name is Bree Callahan. I'm from New Jersey Future. I'm the stormwater manager at New Jersey Future. Um, and the title of my presentation is Rest Easy When It Rains, Why Stormwater Utilities Make Municipal Good Sense. So um, Sheila, if you um, skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as I mentioned, I'm from New Jersey Future. New Jersey Future, if you're not familiar, is a nonpartisan nonprofit. We're based out of Trenton, New Jersey, and we work throughout the state on infrastructure, um, infrastructure and um, planning issues. So uh, in particular, we work on infrastructure as related to water and also as related to transportation. Um, and I'm really happy to be here to chat with you. Okay, next slide, please. So my talk's gonna go through stormwater. What's the fuss? You know, why is it important? Current stormwater funding practices as they are right now, an introduction to stormwater utilities and the stormwater utility process of how you implement one, stormwater utility investigations in New Jersey, and then really importantly, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection now has a stormwater utility feasibility study grant that's available, and then I'm happy to take any questions. So let's get started. So I'd like to, to first take a, a step back and have a, a poll question. So what choice best describes your position? Are you in local government? And that includes environmental commission members, um, state or federal government, nonprofit, financial engineering consultant, or other. And if you want to drop other in the um, Q&A, um, that'd be great. Uh, give me a really good sense of where I need to start. And, um, you know, um, if you'd like me to skip ahead on certain things. So I just wanted to can... mention, sorry to interrupt, Bree. Uh, I put these two sure. questions in one poll and I realized you had them at two different points, so. That's okay. Uh -huh. So that's our first question. And then our second question is, what do folks think is the biggest hurdle to investigate whether a stormwater utility makes sense for your community? And the questions or the responses are, the cost of the feasibility study, what the political, political concerns are, unsure of where to start, don't want to impose additional fees on residents or something else. So again, if you could put the something else in the Q&A, that'd be great. So I get a, a good sense of um, where folks are coming from. And I'm really looking forward. This is always very interesting to see um, what folks uh, answers are to both of these questions. All right, great. All right, it looks like um, most folks are done answering the poll. Um, Sheila, is it okay if we end the poll here? Okay, so it looks like, um, it looks like we're kind of split. There's a bunch of folks who are uh, local governments and folks who are nonprofit. And then we're you know a little bit of other a little bit of state or federal government and then we're definitely very split on what folks think is the biggest hurdle to investigating whether a stormwater utility makes sense um with the highest vote getters being political concerns and unsure sure of where to start this is great okay thank you so much all right Okay, so moving on to what is stormwater. At this point, many folks know what stormwater is, but I always, I think the stormwater utility poll wants to keep coming back. Um, Sheila, do you know how to get rid of this? Is it gone now? I think uh, it's it gone is. now. Yeah. I okay. See it. All right, great. Um, so I always like to get back to the EPA definition just so we get back to the same, um, you know, keep things consistent. EPA defines stormwater as rain or melting snow that flows off streets, lawns, or other sites. And this is important because a lot of folks um, don't consider melting snow as well. And this is something that a stormwater utility can also pay for. So I like to keep that in mind. 
And really want to keep in mind too is why is stormwater runoff increasing? And we know that it's increasing because of development and increased storm and intensity and frequency. As many folks know, we, you know, um, we had so much rain last week, and then of course, you know, we're, folks are still suffering from the effects of Hurricane Ida. Um, you know, there is the intense frequent, the intensity and frequency of storms is increasing. I think with Ida, um, it cost us. Um, something like two hundred forty-seven point eight million dollars. So you know this this makes you know this makes for um, you know some things that we really need to take into account. Okay, next slide, please. And so that's really what the fuss is about. You know, stormwater fouls our waters, it floods our communities, and it hurts our economy. As you can see from the first picture here, stormwater never travels alone. It carries with it all the contaminants and um, oil and grease and um, you know viruses or anything that's on on the roadways and it carries it into our into our waterways you can see about the flooding you know all communities have been affected by flooding um, folks as I mentioned are still recovering from Ida uh, and, and it's not just you know it's not just property damage it's also increased um, you know, uh, public uh, safety issues, it's increases in um, um, insurance rates, you know, it really, it really hurts our economy. So this is why we need to figure out a way to take care of our stormwater management issues. Okay, so right now, the current stormwater funding practices in the state of New Jersey are through property taxes and through sewer fees. So if you're in a CSO community, you can, you know, pay for, you um, your stormwater management through sewer fees um, in many, you know, MS4 communities, which is a municipal separate storm sewer, which is most of the other communities, you're paying for it in, you know, in your property taxes. Next slide, please. So right now, what are your options for managing stormwater? You could do nothing, which I would argue is really not an option at this point. Um, folks are suffering from all the things we mentioned a little bit earlier on the first slides with flooding and water quality issues um, and even loss of life. I think, you know, a Hurricane Ida, we lost between 30 and 40 people, um, you know, in addition to the, you know, crazy amount of money that, that it also um, cost us in property damage and, and all sorts of other things. Um, so you can, so doing nothing is really not an option. Then you can increase property taxes, which of course none of us really want to do. You can increase sewer rates, again, something that we, you know, don't necessarily want to do, um, or you can create a stormwater utility. And that's what I'm really here to talk to you about today, um, because there are definite benefits for creating a stormwater utility versus increasing your property taxes or sewer rates. So if you could, um, thank you so much, Sheila. So what is a stormwater utility? Taking a step back, it's similar to any other utility. A stormwater utility is a dedicated funding mechanism to pay for a community's stormwater management program. So it's similar to your uh, electric, it's similar to your gas. It is a utility um, where there's dedicated funding to pay for you know, that, um, uh, the use of that um, service. Next slide, please. So you're probably wondering at this point, how many stormwater utilities are there in the United States? Is this common? Is it not common? Well, there are over 2,055 stormwater utilities in the United States. I think last I heard it was about uh, 2,500, could be closer to 3,000. It's rapidly growing. And you can see from this map, um, and this was a study done by Western Kentucky University. They do a stormwater utility study every year. And these are accurate numbers of um, the stormwater utilities across the country. It's not by red state or blue state. It's not by urban or rural. Um, it's really dependent upon municipalities, you know, stormwater management needs. Uh, I think the smallest one, the stormwater, stormwater, the smallest stormwater utility is um, serves 88 people um, in Indian Creek Village, Florida. And the largest stormwater utility is in Los Angeles, and that serves 3 million people. So, you know, it's a very diverse set of populations and geographies. And really, the commonality is folks really need to, you know, they understand that they need to address their stormwater. Okay, next slide, please. Taking a step back, the Clean Stormwater and Flood, Flood Reduction Act is the enabling legislation that we have in New Jersey that allows us to implement stormwater utilities. It allows us, but doesn't require, so it's permissive. It doesn't require local governments to establish stormwater utilities. 
this law was signed into uh, signed into law by um, Governor Murphy in 2019. And of course, you know, after 2019, we had COVID, so you know, stormwater utilities have sort of stalled. But now this is really picking up because there are new requirements um, for the MS4 permits that municipalities have. And with the long-term control, um, um, long control program um, for CSO communities, you know, there are requirements that municipalities need to be able to um, comply with. So if you do create a stormwater utility, the stormwater utility has to collect fees based on the amount of stormwater that a property generates. Typically, this is a function of the amount of impervious coverage that you have on your property. So think parking lots, rooftops, driveways, that sort of thing. Um, it, they can be established by municipalities, counties, groups of municipalities, and sewerage or improvement authorities. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And what's really important is that the funds generated are dedicated solely to stormwater management and can't be used for any other purpose. Okay, next slide, please. We already went through the poll, so we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So the key benefits are that a stormwater utility is equitable. It's equitable because it's based on the amount, it's a user fee, it's based on the amount of stormwater that you are creating and the amount of stormwater um, management that you're acquiring from your property. It's dedicated, meaning that it's set aside. And as I mentioned before, it can only be used for stormwater management purposes. It's stable, which means municipalities can count on it. It's a constant stream of funding. You're not gonna be looking through couch cushions to try and you know, pay for any pipe repairs that are emergencies. Um, this is something that you can use for planning ahead of time. And the sole exemption is for agricultural and horticultural land. So everybody has to pay into the stormwater utility. This is something that um, counties would have to pay into for county roads. Um, you know, municipalities would have to pay into for their municipal roads. Uh, if there are any state roads or federal roads, they would also have to um, pay into the stormwater utility. And the, the other point about being equitable is currently, you know, currently um, nonprofits like ho big hospitals and um, folks who are um, also uh, like educational institutions and folks um, like big box stores who um, are, you know, right now, if it's based on property taxes, they're not really paying for their um, overall um, usage of the stormwater management system. This would change with a stormwater utility. With a stormwater utility, there is no exemption. So it's very equitable. Um, all of those places would be um, paying for their stormwater usage, uh, stormwater management um, based on the amount of impervious coverage that they have. Okay, next slide, please. So what can a utility pay for? It can pay for the establishment of the stormwater utility. It can pay for capital expenditures. Um, this could be any of the pipes or, or um, green or gray infrastructure um, projects. It can pay for operations and maintenance. This is street sweeping and even uh, snow removal that I mentioned before. It can pay for asset management and it can pay for public outreach and education. And any of these requirements under the MS4 um, uh, permit or the long-term control plans. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you an example, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, if you take a look, the um, pie chart on the left is uh, fee distribution based on wastewater flow, which is um, without a stormwater utility. And then the pie chart on the right is fee distribution based on impervious area, which is with a stormwater utility. And if you take a look, you can see the difference between the residential contribution and the non-residential contribution in both. And you could see residential customers are really bare, they're really bearing the burden of stormwater management when it's not um, based on the amount of um, impervious coverage that they have. So 48% um, of the residential customers versus 52% of non-residential -resident on the left and 23% uh, for residential customers versus you know, the 48% that it was without a stormwater utility. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the other... Um, benefit with, a, with the legislation that we have in place with the Clean Stormwater and Flood Reduction Act requires that there be credits involved. So any um, municipality or um, any um, utility or anybody who sets up a stormwater utility has to create a credit structure, thereby um, allowing um, and enabling um, users to be able to reduce their stormwater uh, fee, stormwater utility fee, if they manage stormwater on their property. So if they put in a rain garden or they disconnect their downspouts, that sort of thing, they would receive a credit. 
And there's New Jersey DEP guidance on this um, as part of the legislation. There's um, um, pretty extensive New Jersey DEP guidance on this. Next slide, please. So the steps for establishing a stormwater utility. There are really eight basic steps that we've laid out. You wanna vet the concept with top local officials, establish a core team of internal experts, engage the mayor or county executive or utility director, whoever the, you know, the top folks are. And then you wanna authorize a feasibility study to identify the best options for the community. And this is typically done with a um, outside financial and engineering consultant who can go through all the specifics um, the specific technical, legal, financial information, and figure out um, what you know what would the best setup would be for the municipality. And again, there's a lot of flexibility within the law, so this is a, you know this is a great option. Throughout it, there should be ongoing stakeholder um, and outreach activities, and then you're going to figure out a no-go or go decision, an implementation phase, and a final launch. Okay, next slide. Okay, there are important community questions to ask. You can take a look at these later. I'm gonna go a little bit faster to try and get through the next information. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is even more detailed about the types of questions and how, you know, what, how detailed, the detail of getting through and what the process is for the stormwater utility creation. Next slide, please. Okay, so stormwater utility investigations in New Jersey. Right now we have nine municipalities in New Jersey who are actively um, participating in and sort of uh, working through their feasibility studies. Some are really at the end of the feasibility study process and they're trying to make a decision and some are you know, in the middle and some are you know, at the beginning. From the municipal perspective, folks are typically looking into a stormwater utility because of major flooding issues, because of stormwater infrastructure needs. If they have crumbling you know, infrastructure, um, if they need to replace, um, you know, some of their, um, you know, assets. Um, and then if they have water quality concerns. Um, so these are the main drivers behind stormwater utility investigations in the state currently. Next slide, please. So this is one of the most important parts of this discussion. There is a New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection grant opportunity. And this is a no cost grant opportunity to localities. Um, the, um, Deadline for the application is November 1st. It is a very simple application. It's an, a letter, a simple letter of expression of interest. Um, at New Jersey Future, we've created um, a draft or a template. So if anybody is interested or wants further information, my contact information is at the end of this. I'd be happy to help you put, put the application together or apply. But this is something that we're not sure if there's gonna, it's gonna come around again. Um, we wanna just make sure folks are, you know, getting the word out about this opportunity. Again, it's no cost. Um, municipalities would get the opportunity to work with um, consultants who are national experts, uh, and they would create a stormwater utility feasibility study for your municipality. Next slide, please. Okay, and then we have this, we have a bunch of resources through New Jersey Future, including the Stormwater Utility Resource Center, our peer learning exchange, um, and some pro bono consulting um, support, and I'd be happy to put those in the chat, um, you know, at the end here. Next slide, please. Okay, we can click through the next two slides. And this is just more information through the resources that we have. Okay, next slide, please. And that's my contact information and I'd be happy to answer any questions that any folks, uh, that folks may have. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing this now. So I have a question to read you now from Jeff uh, Free. Uh, sure. He asks, is stormwater from new impervious parking lot allowed to be pumped into wetland pond unfiltered? And I guess he's talking about a particular pond that he says is also designated as a wildlife refuge. I'm not sure about that. Um, can you repeat that question again? Is the stormwater is stormwater from a new impervious parking lot allowed to be pumped into a wetland pond unfiltered? And then he mentions that the pond is in a ref in wildlife refuge. So I don't know. Doesn't it get filtered as it goes through down through the parking lot? I don't know. Uh, well, typically runoff, you know, just comes off of the parking lot. Um, I don't. I you'd have to talk to a consultant about that. I don't know. Um, 
if Elizabeth, if you wanted to handle that question or whether um, that's something that we'd have to take a look at the specifics of the situation. And I think that's the, the key issue, uh, Bree, is that you need to understand what is the local code and how it's established in the management of stormwater, as well as making sure that state regulations have been met. One of the things that may be happening, and, and I don't know the specific case, so I, I'm simply taking a guess at this, is that the actual receiving body of water is being used as a filtration device. Now, again, I don't know that that's the case, but it is not uncommon to see that impervious area is routed through the filtration that occurs naturally in a pond or in a wetland. Uh, so it takes further investigation to give you a, a final answer on what might be happening here. It starts again with what local code and state requirements uh, were put in place at the time of the construction of the parking lot. But as I say, it's not uncommon to use the natural receiving stream for a pond or a wetland as a filtration device. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth, would you like to um, begin your presentation? Sure, I'd be happy to. Let me share and let's see if it's working properly. Sure is. We can see it? Yep. I'm going to reach over here and actually turn off a screen because I think it helps with the lighting, <laughs> hopefully, in, in this. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Treadway. I'm Principal Program Manager with WSP, U.S. Environment and Infrastructure Solutions. I have been um, engaged in the utility business for stormwater since I enacted my own as a Public Works Services Director uh, I'll tell you the year, which, you know, is 30 years ago that happened. Uh, and so I've been doing this in the business for a long time. And I've had the opportunity to work with communities all across the United States and Canada. It was interesting that as I looked at the map that Bray had up, I noticed that Wyoming is sitting there with no stormwater utilities. And I have the privilege actually right now of working for Jackson and Laramie for the very purpose of putting in a new funding mechanism. So perhaps in the future, we'll see that that zero goes to two, but it's early in the process. I think, again, you could ask yourself, well, you know, Elizabeth, you put yours in in, in 1992, 93. Um, why are communities still implementing utilities? I mean, you'd think that as the water and sewer industry certainly has matured, eventually stormwater utility implementation is going to be a, a thing of the past in the sense that those who are going to do this uh, have already done it. Uh, but there are two pressures at work here. One is authorizing legislation. So New Jersey is now empowered, which is absolutely terrific that there is enabling legislation. And I will tell you as someone who does work all over the United States and Canada, you have a terrifically well-crafted uh, legislative structure. Uh, I applaud the authors of that legislation. It's, it is well done. But the second thing is the issues of stormwater are not going away and they won't go away until we see ourselves investing as a nation, as a state, as local governments in solving the trigger problems that are really uh, creating havoc on our streets, in our streams, in order to protect them from a water quality perspective. Uh, we're responding to regulatory mandates, but money is the biggest challenge of us meeting all of these issues. The critical thing that Bree talked about you know, why a utility? Why would you go to a new funding source? Uh, it is a complex process. It does take time and thoughtfulness to get there. 
But the fact that it provides you that stable, adequate, flexible, and equitable funding stream that ties the program of services to the purpose, the demand for a public drainage system is really the critical element here. It is a dedicated fund. It does provide you with long range planning capability. If you know, as my community in, in 30 years ago, was able to put together a decade strategy for how our investments would go forward. It was powerful for us to be able to do that. It is a privilege to having been a part of that for my community when I was there as public services director. The change that we were able to put in place by equitably distributing the, the cost across all properties within the community made such a difference in the economic well being and the health of our community. The end result of stormwater utilities is really multi dimensional. When you see pictures like this, you can understand that some action needs to take place. You can turn to your public works operations and ask the question, why haven't you done something before? And the simple answer is a lack of resources. It's a competition for money when you're working from the general fund tax base. It is a competition against absolutely equally important very difficult to solve issues in the community, whether it's police, fire, education, health, recreation, the competition for dollars leads us to these kinds of outcomes that have to be dealt with. Water quality became an issue in 1990, a regulatory issue. It was always an issue, but it became a regulatory uh, challenge in 1990 when the Water Quality Act of 1987, which mandated the stormwater permits, led to the regulations that require the MS4 permits across the board. My community happened to be one of the first because we were a large MS4, which required our permit to be put in place by 1993. When you have too much water, when we're seeing the kinds of impacts of an Ida or recently an Ian or a Michael or an Henri, or you can name it, the list is long. These kinds of challenges, folks really um, have a difficult time understanding what the solutions could be. These require analysis and studies. These studies are not inexpensive. To be able to understand how can you move from a flooded community, a community where the infrastructure is collapsing, to a community that can be vibrant and strong. The problems are real. The problems are unsolved. When you see these kind of headlines, appearing in newspapers across the country, you know that there now is momentum for change. And that change comes with a massive price tag. It's in the multiple billions of dollars nationwide that the underserved, unfunded stormwater systems are really challenged to deal with. It is in numbers that you know, are impressive from the standpoint of what needs to be invested in. This is my community where I live now. I live in Northeast Tennessee. This is Johnson City, Tennessee. And I share this story because it shows you the power of what new resources can do for a community. The picture on the right I share because of the vibrancy that you can see the changes that have been made in my town. Originally, that downtown area over the years and decades had lost its economic base. It was heavily manufacturing. 
all of those manufacturing plants left this community in the 1980s and 1990s. Trying to get a healthy growth back in and reinvestment downtown would not occur until the stream you see to the left was daylighted. This stream used to be running forced underground through massive culverts. When the town developed in the early 1900s, the stream that was naturally occurring running through downtown was put into very large culverts, except those culverts create a lack of capacity over time. As development occurred around through both residential and business, we have a major university, one of the top 10 medical schools in the country is in our community. As the university grew, the pressure on this stream became more and more difficult to control until our downtown in a simple afternoon thunderstorm in the summer would be six, eight, 10 inches of water. In a violent storm, an extreme event, the leftovers of a hurricane, for example, it would be measured in tens and twenties of feet. The utility was put in earlier, about 12 years ago. With that shift, investment in downtown occurred in the multiple tens of millions of dollars. The stream was daylighted. The floodplain was restored. The health of this community came back. This is what the power of a stormwater utility can be. And so if your community is asking this question, I challenge you to start with trying to answer why. What's unique about your community? What's happening? What is the challenge that all these services that can be funded, and Bree went over the major categories, but this gives you the detail. All of these services that can be covered through your utility can change the way you look at water quality, can change the way you manage your floodplains, can offer opportunities to invest, can attract new development, can increase the health and, and welfare of your community. These are important services, each and every one, from administration to capital improvements. All of this can be addressed by taking the time to evaluate what does it really cost us? What is the true dollars and cents? If we could solve these problems over time, where can this money take us? And it's this kind of detailed financial analysis that leads to solving this important issue that Bree also noted, the equity and fairness of who pays. Again, in my community, major university, major federal facilities, one of the largest VA hospitals uh, and retirement centers happens to be in our town. If they're exempt from participating in paying the cost, how do you explain to a resident that you're the one that has to pick up the burden? You're the one that has to pay the bill. And then you can work through the process of expanding that equity and sharing the reality as Bree demonstrated what was happening in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's happening in those thousands of utilities across the country. You're engaging the entire population of landowners in solving the problem. So how do you get started? You, know, it, that you have to find that point of entry. How do you get started? Well, you get started by proving that you have issues that have to be addressed. If your community is looking at this as a particular challenge, prove that you have these kinds of problems. Do your homework. Collect all the information necessary to understand what's really happening 
so that you can quantify those into the needs within a program and funding organization. Know that the most important piece of this is transparency. Going after new revenue is not easy. Uh, again, I, I work in communities of all shapes and sizes in all cultures all across North America. It is absolutely critical that you start with transparency. I have a terrific friend that I was able to work for as a consultant. We were peers as public works officials. And Tom said to me as I started the project for him, uh, we're not going to involve the public. I, we know better than the public does. So we're just not going to involve the public. We're going to work through the process. I understand you're recommending we do this, but we're going to work through this process. We'll make the decisions. We'll get to our elected officials. They'll understand that our engineering and public works people know the answers. Guess what happened, of course, when we presented the findings to the elected body? The mayor's first question, what does the public have to say? What did the public tell you? How did you reach out to the public? Have, have there been public meetings? And Tom had to stand there and, and own it when he said, we haven't talked to the public. Guess what? I got paid twice to do the work because we started all over again and we had to. We engaged a group of citizens that represented everything from the development community, the local university, the flooded housewife. We had a group of citizens that met and worked with me over 14 months because we started all over again. Their first statement of the very first meeting was, why are we here? Because you've already made all the decisions. And that's why we had to start all over again. We gave them the power to provide the foundation. No surprises. You need to know who your public is. You need to know what your messages are. You need to know how you're going to communicate. You absolutely want an engaged public to be involved in solving the issues. You are not going to get full consensus. If you think, I mean, there aren't enough years left in front of you if you think you will get to a full consensus. You're looking for a process of informed consent. The more you educate, the more you engage, the more you ask for input, the more you honor the input that's received, the more you reach a point at which a group of individuals will say to you, I get it. None of us want to have to pay any more money, but we understand and we will help educate our neighbors, our friends at church, our school teachers, whatever our relationships can bring to the table. The basic logic is so sound. This problem will not be solved without resources. If you've got water that you don't want to have in your streets, that is polluting your streams, that is impacting your business community, government has to stand up and be the leader to solve in order to create those benefits. You have to be able to give understanding of what that basic logic is in the utility that problems are real, money is our only answer. We will do this logically, we will do it practically, we will be efficient, we will be optimal in use of those funds, we will keep the public informed, we will report back to the public. Justifications for a utility that don't work, and I've had these presented to me before, if my slideshow would just keep working, that doesn't seem to want to. The government, as Bree explained, is not requiring this. It, it, they just aren't. Early in the days when we were doing utility work, 
there was lots of politicians. In fact, in the state of Tennessee, it's almost a terrible joke that, in fact, by state legislation, utilities are required to put on their bill that the federal government mandated that the utility be created. You're required to put it on the bill. It's a law. Of course, it doesn't tell you that you can put it in six point type and no one can read it, but you're required to put it on the bill. That's rather ridiculous. Everybody else has one. Yes, there are thousands of them across the United States, but that certainly is not true. And it's not a good reason to do something. We can be first. I have heard this said a number of times. We want to be first. And I, I, coach and counsel one of my team as well as the, the folks we work with, get your ego out of the way because you don't really want to be putting yourself and your ego out there in front of the world. Another thing I often hear from our politicians is, hey, we can pull the current services out of the general fund. You know, that fire truck we've been wanting to buy. We'll have a great windfall. We can use those funds. Uh, you know, it, there may be some of that, but you can only do it once because it only happens one time if you're moving those current services into the utility. To be successful, and you've, you've certainly heard me emphasize how important it is to have the public on your side. The process that we follow is really to understand the concept of feasible. It's politically feasible. That's one of the questions you're gonna answer. It's operationally feasible. And by that, you have to be able to Calculate a bill, execute sending it, collecting it, being able to enforce, provide appropriate policy. That's what a feasibility study is going to do for you. It's going to be able to answer those questions. And so you can do a feasibility study with or without the use of a, of a public-based advisory committee. The question becomes, how efficient then can it be? I'm often asked, you know, how long does it take to do a feasibility study? Can we do this in just a couple of months? I will tell you without a, an advisory committee, maybe, maybe. I wouldn't advise it to be done that quickly, but maybe. With an advisory committee to get from your initial concept through your feasibility study to implementation, you're at 12 months, maybe more. I recently had the experience of working with Allentown, Pennsylvania in 19, oh, 19, sorry, 2017, 2018. They were facing a very difficult situation. They had been audited by the federal government for their, uh, their um, phase one permit. They were found to be um, significantly out of compliance and they had to get their stormwater program up and operating very quickly. We kicked off that project the last week of March. The ordinance was adopted in October. Bills went out in January. That is an extremely challenging and difficult timeline. I will tell you that. Um, my team and I spent three to, to five days a week in their offices for months to build a program to get all the policy decisions, to work with the politicians, to work with the public. That was extremely strenuous. Do not think that it is reasonable to go from start to implementation. The ordinance adopted in six and a half months of work. That's not normal. Be realistic about the time that you have. Your feasibility study gives you the legal foundation to move forward. This is so important. Um, I've had clients ask, can't we just adopt a rate and figure it out later? 
And I can tell you that um, professionally, um, that's not an that's not a community that we choose to work with. Uh, the city of Atlanta took that approach. We were their consultant. We sent them the letter that no consultant wants to ever have to write to a client. I'm sorry, but we have to withdraw from this project. We will not support the approach that you're taking. What you're doing is really undermining the legal foundation for a utility. Ultimately, they were sued. They lost in court. They had to return all the fees that were collected and with interest. Um, it is important to go through the difficult steps of building the policy around governance, your program, your legal structure, your financial policies, how you're going to get the bills out the door. And to accomplish that, I would also coach any community that wants to proceed. There needs to be a champion inside the organization. This is complex work. It involves your finance. It involves budget folks. It involves the elected officials. It involves leadership. It involves accounting. It involves the mail room. You, I mean, it's a host of people that are impacted by putting in a new utility. You need someone as a champion in the organization who is willing to take on this challenge because it's lots of moving parts and it really does need to be done well. When you want to move forward, uh, you, I want you to be able to create and describe your vision, the issues that need to be solved, how you currently do your business, how you want to do your business, what it currently costs, what the legal process is in your community to move forward. An internal team, and Bree emphasized this, an internal team that can focus on all those things from legal through leadership, you will be successful. It's all in the process. Bree laid out and gave you a visual of a very complex process, and, and it is complex. It's lots of moving parts. It's lots of policy. It's lots of important decisions. It's lots of stop and think and making sure that you're going to spend the money wisely. The public expects that of you. I'm going to end right here. I'm going to also reiterate what Bree shared with you. I had the privilege of working with Bree as an advisor in the building of the Stormwater Utility Resource Center. I emphasize to you that you should use the material that's there. It's available. It gives you tremendous amount of background. It was built by a team of experts who know this business, who understand the process, who gave a lot of material to New Jersey in order for you as a state to be successful. It was a privilege to be a part of it. And I thank you for that opportunity and certainly can uh, answer any questions and I will stop sharing as soon as I turn on my screen so that I can see everything else. Excuse me while I work on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for all that. I really appreciate hearing about your experiences, particularly when you were talking about um, the, the one challenge with transparency and not involving the public um, and, and, and how that kind of uh, that, that stopped and you had to start all over again. So um, up next, we have Patricia Lindsay Harvey, who uh, her town of Willingboro is, is, is looking into this right now. So I'd be interested to hear what kind of steps you've been taking and, and how that experience has been for, for your township and for your utility authority. No, thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you to um, Bree and Elizabeth. Your presentations were phenomenal. I always love listening to both of you. Um, I don't have a presentation per se. I want to just talk you know, straight to you. And um, I think one of the things that we, we cannot forget is that we all have to be concerned about this issue, about flooding, runoff, uh, storm surges, because of the increase of uh, frequency in the 
volatility of uh, storms due to climate change, plus the fact that the continual development um, is creating more impervious surfaces. And one viable solution is the creation of a stormwater util utility and green infrastructure methods uh, for stormwater management. And it's one of the things that Willingboro is, is looking into is um, implementing some green infrastructure um, into our town. Um, the solutions are not only green, but they're phenomenal uh, environmentally. Um, in our municipality, all of our major uh, roadways in our town was created this way, already has um, beds in all of our major roadways. Uh, so that has been able to keep a lot of the stormwater off of our major roadways. I think that Levin may have been a little bit ahead of his time in creating that. Uh, not to mention, but, um, you know, the beautification of the community and there's benefits to the residents. It's increasing their um, property values. Uh, it's going to help soil from eroding. It's going to provide natural habitat for wildlife. And it also engages the community because you want the community engaged. Um, stormwater utility can pay for some of that green infrastructure. Um, because you know it's going to mimic the natural systems for filtering the water through the soil, and the vegetation is going to help clean it, and it's going to reduce the amount of water uh, while the pollutants uh, travel with the unfiltered, un untreated water into our storm drains and local waterways. Um, the stormwater utility to to us is a small price to pay um, because you're going to pay for it one way or the other you know, with thousands, perhaps millions of dollars in damages to properties and even loss of life. So when you're thinking about stormwater, it's not enough just to talk about stormwater. You know, we're not just talking about rainwater, we're talking about melting snow and melting ice, you know, because winter's coming. So that's a lot of snow and a lot of ice. Uh, we have to also be concerned about the pollutants and the contaminants like uh, pesticides, you know, fertilizers that people are using on their lawns. Uh, in the stormwater runoff that's picking it up along the way on the parking lots and sidewalks um, that could potentially uh, pollute our waterways, uh, harm our land and our aquatic life. Uh, one of the things that we encountered in Willingboro is that we have inefficient storm drains. The holes are too small to handle the massive amount of water when we get large storms. And we're thinking that, you know, the um, stormwater utility money that we'll get for that will help maybe pay to fix that, that issue. Um, Willingboro has a, a large amount of pervious surface because we're mainly a residential community uh, and all the homes have driveways and we have um, some commercial properties. Um, and I think that um, elected officials have been, in the past have been reluctant to cre create a stormwater utility, um, citing that residents might be up in arms about um, another tax or fee or whatever you wanna call it. But at some point, we gotta take the blinders off. Uh, we gotta get some kahunas here and tackle this problem before it really gets out of hand or before the state mandates um, communities to create one. And I guess I'm really passionate about this because in June of 2018, Willingboro got flooded. Many of our areas got flooded. And you can imagine, you know, walking to someone's home and everything's wet and seeing the pain and the tears in their eyes. And some people did not have flood insurance because we weren't in a flood zone and had to walk away from their home. Can you imagine having to walk away from the home that you have built a life in and now you can't live there anymore and you can't rebuild it? Um, I would really rather see all of us voluntarily um, create a stormwater utility rather than being forced to do it um, because it may be something that we're not gonna be happy with or, or agree with. And I think we have to look past the fee that may be uh, imposed and look at the benefits to the social, environmental and, and financial areas. Uh, for one thing, utilities can, stormwater utility can create jobs. Um, it's going to help reduce flooding. It's going to enhance um, your water quality, um, enhance your grounds, and you know, really can create some peaceful outdoor sanctuaries, um, improve fishing, reduce um, pollution, make your community more sustainable, um, and preserve the economics of your water-based um, tourism. 
everything has caused the fact, you know, we as humans have caused this problem and that has resulted in climate change. Um, and we're going to have to be the ones to fix it. You know, we really don't have the right to leave this planet in a worse shape for the next generation. We don't have that right. Um, from an missile utility authority perspective, uh, for the most part, wastewater and stormwater are very different. Wastewater is treated and then it's released back into the environment. Stormwater is rainwater that is, doesn't soak into the ground. It flows over all those different areas. It's untreated and with all those pollutants and contaminants that it picks up along the way. And the, the one thing that hurt that, 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 that we've experienced is with, that when we have um, additional water, stormwater that enters our system, it dilutes the chemicals uh, formulation that's used to treat the wastewater. So now we're wasting chemicals, we're wasting money, and the additional that stormwater uh, made to the tr treatment process, it makes the treatment process ineffective. So in essence, we're putting water back into the nature that's not totally treated. Um, and I think it's um, the, our Willingboro Community um, uh, Environmental Commission has received the grant. We're working um, towards our feasibility study to um, create a stormwater utility in our municipality. And we wanted to jump on this uh, right away um, before, and I think eventually this is gonna be mandated. So we wanted, we wanted to get ahead of the, ahead of the, ahead of the game. And I th think it's also a good idea for your environmental commission to work along with your municipal utility authority, because there may be ways for the authority to capture that water and treat it before it goes uh, into our waterways. So the bottom line in creating a stormwater utility ensures that it's gonna ensure that everybody's gonna pay their fair share. And you're gonna reduce your stormwater runoff and the damages that that's gonna cause. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you a question, Pat. Um, yes. Have you been, um, when you're talking to you know, people in your community about this, have you reached out to the business community and what has been the response? Because that, that slide that Bree showed about how, you know, before and after stormwater utility, how, how the, that financial burden gets shifted to those who are creating more, pay more. Um, how, how is that getting, what kind of response we haven't you we haven't tackled that yet. We're just kind of working on the residential part and you know mm -hmm. holding our breath for the for the for the commercial part. Um, you know, because when you're looking at a community and, and if you do this, you also run the risk of a business owner saying, Well, listen, that's that's more money I'm gonna have to pay. I can go to this community over here. If I move over there, I don't have to pay that. So you've got to weigh that. Um, but either way, I think we're gonna have to do it. Thanks. So um, please put in your questions into the question and answer um, box. And I actually have one for, for Elizabeth that follows up on, on what Patricia was just saying, like how, what has been your experience um, when you're reaching out to businesses? Um, and there's that concern of, well, we'll shift to the next community because we don't wanna deal with paying for that. Um, I, I know you have some examples on, on the benefits of, of, of how it's improved communities, but I was wondering how, how you've, dealt with that. How do you deal with that? Well, again, first of all, number one principle, you're transparent. You, you don't try to make this prettier because you think somehow that's going to make it easier. No, you, you're right up front with folks. The, the key thing is to help them understand that this is a, a project built on the concept of equity and that the balance of the distribution of cost is driven by those properties that are creating demand for a public service. And you start with that, okay? That's the intellectual side of what you're doing. You give them as much information as you possibly can about their own situation. And Bree talked about the credits that are there. The fact that credit programs are mandated in the state of New Jersey, which is terrific, it allows you to then establish recognition of private investment that supports the public good. Now, that private investment could be regulatorily driven. They're doing it because if you want to develop, that's the way the rules read. But it recognizes that that private development 
was required to invest to reduce their burden on the demand for the public system. And you acknowledge that. And so you're upfront about what it's going to cost. I typically encourage communities to sit down with their top um, rate payers, those folks who are going to be really contributing significant dollars. Uh, and and bring them to the table one on one. Show them their property. Show them how you're calculating their bill. Give them that information well in advance so that they can build it in their budgets. Recognize that their policy on how they may want to transfer that cost. Let's say it's a strip mall and it's the owner of the strip mall that's going to get the bill. They own the impervious area, but they're going to distribute that cost. That's in their hands. You are not going to regulate how they decide to redistribute that charge to renters of, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 businesses that may be there. You collaborate with them. You tell them up front. You be honest. You sit down. You ask for their support. It may sound like a funny thing to do. You ask for their support because you've educated them on what the challenges are and what you're trying to solve. They do not want to see their community underwater. And the issue around, they're just gonna leave. First of all, if it's a national chain, they're not gonna leave. Most of those chains all know that these things exist. They're in thousands of other communities. They will sit down with you, in fact, well in advance and wanna know, you know, basically just tell me what my bill is going to be so I can build it into my budget. They're all well versed. For your smaller businesses, it's be a partner with them. Look for opportunities. Perhaps they're in the position to have land that you need as a public agency to solve a problem. They may have the best spot for you to be able to put in that new detention or to redirect the flow through a treatment works, but you need to cross their property. Look for opportunities in which they become partners, in which you're sharing public revenues in order to solve multiple problems. Long answer, but, but the critical thing is tell them the truth, be transparent, don't be defensive. You're doing this on behalf of the whole community. This is an investment in your economic well being. And Give them the facts about their own property. That's usually what they're looking for. Will you win them all over? No. Nobody's going to come skipping and jumping to be able to get with balloons in their hands. I can't wait to write my check. Let's have a party. Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> but if you solve a problem that enhances their business capability, that's a value that you're delivering to them for the long term. This is a business. You need to learn that you're putting in, and, and Pat certainly understands this when you're running an authority, it's a business. It's a business inside government. Revenues and expenditures have got to balance. You can't run in the negative. And so you're going to talk the same business terms to business and industry that you do in running your own business. Thank you. So uh, do we have any more questions? I don't know if we do. I don't think we do. Is that it? Yeah, I don't see anything, Sheila. All right. Do, do you guys have any last words that you would like to impart before we say good evening to everyone? Or I, I really appreciate what you were just saying, Elizabeth, about you know the transparency that, that's coming through loud and clear. Uh, transparency and, and making having the business bring having people be your partners in it. So that, that's a really interesting aspect. But um do you have any other last words that you would like to share? Don't be afraid of doing this. You know, get yourself somebody to help you through it. Um, makes there's there are a lot of great talent out there to work with. Um, I I love the opportunity and and I certainly would be there to help if any community asks. But don't be afraid of this. Uh, do it right. Don't skip a step. Uh, communities that have rushed 
made mistakes. It's generational before they can bring it back. Oh. And we want to solve problems right now. Right? Thank you. How about you, Bree? I think uh, you know you have your your peer learning exchange and all these all these tools that people can use to do just that. So, do you have any last words that you'd like to share? Sure. Thanks, Sheila. Um, I really like to point folks to the New Jersey Stormwater Utilities Resource Center. Elizabeth mentioned that a little bit. And then the other thing is the peer learning exchange that we have. It's a closed community of consultants and um, New Jersey officials, and then folks outside of New Jersey who've implemented stormwater utilities in their own um, jurisdictions. And they're willing to answer your questions. I'm willing to answer your questions. Um, you know, uh, join you know, take a look at the peer learning exchange, join um, the whole thing about, you know, I'd like to just build on what Elizabeth said, you're trying to build trust, right? We're trying to build trust so that we can solve a problem. And if, you know, you're not, if you're not transparent and you're not upfront with folks, there will be no trust and you won't actually be able to solve this problem. And the problem is affecting everyone, right? The business inter, the businesses are not only dealing with, you know, um, increased stormwater utility, fees, but they're going to be dealing with business interruption and all sorts of other things. So in many cases, there are things that they need to solve as well. So as long as everybody's upfront about it, and you understand what problems, you know, you're trying to solve, be on the same page. Um, you know, folks will just, folks understand. I mean, at this point, folks understand what stormwater is. They understand the, um, they understand the, uh, you know, the impact of all the storms that we've been having. And so, you know, there are resources out there anybody needs any, you know, information or extra resources, please, you know, contact me. But um, as Elizabeth said, don't be afraid of this. Um, it is a tool, you know, for your community to be able to take advantage of. Um, and hopefully they'll be able to solve a lot of the stormwater problems that we're suffering from right now. Thank you. And Patricia, do you have any any last uh, words of advice to communities that are, are, are considering embarking on, on exploring this opportunity? All I can say is that, you know, we all have to work together to solve this problem. It's not going to go away. You can't hide from it. So let's, you know, let's grab it by the horns and let's let's get 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 it done. Great. Thank you all so much for uh, presenting and sharing your expertise with our commissioners. And thanks to all the commissioners who've, who've been here. And thank you, Liz, as always, for running the ship. <laughs> thank you so, all. Um, thank you all. Really a lot, a lot, ladies. It was great. Really terrific. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a good Bye. day. Thanks, Liz. Bye, everybody. Bye.